Welcome to Casual Politics. Sir George, I'm very grateful to you that you accepted my request and thank you very much okay. for it. I know you need no introduction. You've been Member of Parliament since 1974 mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you, uh, you were promoted under John Major to uh, actually to the Treasury as Financial Secretary to the Treasury and then your promotion to Secretary of uh, to the um, Transport Ministry as the Secretary of State for Transport and then you became uh, Leader of the House under David Cameron and and then Chief Whip for, and then your your in 2013 you announced your retirement from politics after more than 40 years. So my first question is, how did you get involved in politics? Well, initially, my wife and I lived um, just over the river in Lambeth, uh, in Clapham on the edge of Brixton. And the surroundings there were quite challenging. It was uh, not a very prosperous part of inner London. And we both thought we should do something about the area in which we lived. So we both stood for Lambeth Borough Council. That was back in 1968. Uh, and we were both elected along with John Major, who also stood uh, for Lambeth Borough Council. And we spent three years in control, it's about the only time the Conservatives had run the borough. And I got an appetite for politics. Um, we were in control, we could uh, improve the conditions, and we stopped demolishing um, perfectly good terraced housing and replacing it with tar blocks, which was what was happening in the 60s. Um, but I, I discovered then that although Lambeth could do quite a lot, there was an, a tier above us, the Greater London Council, that actually had the strategic power. So um, I then stood for the GLC, and then I discovered there was a bo body above the GLC that really ran the country, namely Parliament. So uh, the, the short answer is it was a reaction to uh, the challenges of the area in which we were living, um, what, 40 years ago, that we got involved in politics, and then I've been very lucky in that I've maintained the political career, uh, Borough Council, GLC, Parliament, uh, back since, uh, well, since 1968. And you're actually, you, uh, you're very well known in the 80s for opposing um, Lady Thatcher's poll tax. Yeah. Uh, it struck me the poll tax was never a, a, a very sensible policy. Uh, it meant that the better off paid less in community charge or poll tax, and the less well off people paid more. And that struck me as uh, unfair. It was also quite bureaucratic in that however poor you were, you had to pay something, 10% community charge. And so it struck me as, as an unpopular, aggressive form of taxation. And I opposed it from within the party. And um, that parliament introduced the poll tax, but also it abolished it. And then the party got re-elected uh, in 1992 under, under John Major. I think it was the only time I've had a serious disagreement with my party. Uh, but I think it was a misguided policy, as most people will now concede. And I think it was right to stand up against it. And then she brought back, uh, she she brought you back to a government to reunite your, uh, the, uh, the party. So was she successful in doing that? Was she uh, successful to uh, to reunite? Successful. Yeah. Um, successful. Well, what what happened in 1990? There was a reshuffle. Yes. And she brought me back from the back benches and put me back into the whip's office. And I think we were approaching an election and she wanted to heal the wounds in the party and bring some people back who'd been uh, rebellious. Um, it wasn't wholly successful because uh, three months later she was replaced by John Major. Um, so from her point of view, uh, it may have helped to heal the wounds in the party, but it didn't uh, save her from, uh, from being uh, uh, replaced by John Major. And how was the transition to, uh, from, to move from actually to work with a leader who was very pragmatic and then to just work with another leader who was not pragmatic at all, like John Major? Well, all Prime Ministers have different styles of government. Uh, John Major had a more consensual approach. And I think that's what the country wanted. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was absolutely right for the 1980s. The country was facing serious structural problems. We needed trade union reform. We needed to privatise the loss-making state industries. And Margaret Thatcher introduced reforms that the country desperately needed. By the end of the 80s, I think the country was, was moving on to something more consensual, uh, less abrasive. Um, and John took over from Margaret and then won an election. I think if we'd stayed with Margaret Thatcher in 1990, we would have lost the 1992 general election. And I think an incoming Labour government would then have unwound a lot of the reforms that she had introduced. Whereas John Major was able to 
have that extra five years embed the reforms that Margaret Thatcher had introduced, but also oblige the Labour Party to change themselves. So when they did come in, they didn't unwind all our reforms on the trade unions and on privatisations. So I think the, the, the transition to a different style of government was actually the long term long -term interest of the country. And rebellions from the back benches that defeat actually uh, was one of the major reasons that um, defeated John Major's government in 1997. Do you think that is still alive, uh, alive in Cam David Cameron's government? Well, I think there are many reasons why we didn't win in 1997. I think if you look at this country's history, it would have been unprecedented for a single party to have won every election from 1979 to 1997 and stay in office. Um, this is a democratic country, we have a two-party system, and I think the country took the view that having had over 17 years of Conservative government, it was time for a change, and because we had made the Labour Party reform itself, it was safe to change to Labour. And I think that's why we lost, that people got tired of the Conservatives and thought it was safe to vote uh, um, Labour. Uh, ever since I've been in the party, there has been uh, a view within the party that we shouldn't be members of the European Union. It was there in the 1970s uh, when we joined under Ted Heath. It was there in the 1980s, it was there in the 1990s, and it's still here. Uh, it hasn't stopped us doing very well in general elections. And, um, and then you, uh, when um, the major government, they got defeated in 1997, and then when uh, your part again, Conservatives, they got re-elected in, in 2010, you were appointed as the leader of the House of Commons. And so my question is, in what ways your role as a leader of the House was challenging? Well, we introduced some important reforms. Um, we gave back to the House of Commons the ability to choose the agenda for roughly one day a week. Uh, for the whole of the last century, the government dominated the agenda. Uh, the government decided what the House should debate and when. Uh, and one of the reforms we introduced was to uh, set up a backbench business committee, to give them roughly a day a week, and they could decide the subject and whether or not we had a vote on it. So that was one important reform. Uh, another reform was to enable the House to elect the Select Committee Chairman. That's given the Select Committee Chairman an authority and autonomy they didn't have before. We introduced elections for members of the select committees. So what we tried to do is to give back to the House of Commons some of the powers that it had lost. Uh, the other thing we did was to make sure we didn't bombard the House with legislation that it simply couldn't consider properly. So we decided to have fewer bills and give the House more time to consider them rather than guillotine everything, which was the way the last Labour government was going. So those were some of the challenges uh, that uh, the incoming Cameron government faced. And uh, was it uh, was it the hard, hard task for you to face because uh, we, we didn't have a coalition government since 1945? Well, the coalition was new. Yes. Um, it meant that the government had a majority uh, and a good working majority. And I think that was important because back in 2010, this country faced some real strategic problems on uh, confidence in the currency, confidence in economic policy. And I think if we hadn't had a government with a strong majority determined to reform the public finances, things would have been very difficult um, uh, indeed. Uh, you're right, it was the first coalition, uh, formal coalition since the 40s. We did have a period of minority government in the 1970s when there was the Lib Lab Pact. Yes, the agreement, it was not a coalition. Between it was an agreement, it was between, a pact yes. How was uh, that, um, that didn't really give the government the, the solidarity that it needed. And of course the Liberal Democrats, the Liberals as they then were, didn't have ministers in the government. So I think it was, I think it was a bold decision by Nick Clegg to join the Conservatives in a, in a coalition. I think it was the right thing for the country, but I hope my party will win outright next time. And then you became, you were promoted to become a chief, sec, uh, chief whip. And um, is it true that uh, MPs have become more independent, so they now they are more free to defy the chief whip than it was in the 1960s? Well, I think uh, since the 1950s, there has been a trend towards more independence. In the 1950s, there were very few rebellions. Most, part, most Tory MPs voted with the, with the government. Uh, this has been the most rebellious parliament ever. Uh, but the last parliament uh, was also quite rebellious, but because they had such a huge majority, it wasn't 
noticeable. I think uh, MPs are on that, more independent they minded, they're more conscious of issues in their um, constituency, and they need more persuasion uh, than they did in order to support the party. Um, some people say this is healthy as a chief whip. Um, I, um, I would prefer it for people to vote with the government rather than uh, against it. I think it is a fact of life, we've got to work with it. And um, over uh, the bill of um, Syria, uh, how difficult was it to unite the party to vote for the government's bill? Well, as, as you've seen in the, in, in the vote, about 30 Conservative MPs uh, didn't vote for um, action in Syria. Um, but they were joined by the Labour Party and a substantial number of um, Liberal Democrats. Uh, I think we always knew that there were uh, a number of Conservative MPs who would not support military intervention. Uh, there was a shadow of Iraq still cast over Parliament. And if you look at the speeches they made, it was always quite clear that some would vote against. I think that what, what happened was that we tried to table a motion that the Labour Party would support. And uh, in fact, we thought we had tabled a motion the Labour Party would support. But in the, in the event, they, they decided not to. And that's why uh, the motion wasn't carried. I think if you are going to um, have a vote on military action, it's best to have the United, a United House of Commons. So even if we had scraped through, the fact that the opposition had voted against it, I think would have reduced its impact in world politics. And in your op opinion, was it one of the most humiliating moments for a government? Since no, I think, um, no, I think, uh, I think the Prime Minister responded um, immediately after the vote. Um, with, with, with grace, um, he recognised that um, there wasn't uh, a majority in the House and then moved on. I, 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 th I think he handled it very well. And in fact, it's not an issue that people still remember in the House of Commons, or indeed, um, it's not an issue that comes up the whole time as we approach a general election. Obviously, you want to win a vote, but I think we accepted that there wasn't a majority for military action. Uh, and so we, we, we didn't try and reverse it, we said okay, and we moved on. And some ministers, they got sacked because they had not voted for the motion. Um, can we just pause there? Who, who got sacked because they didn't Junior vote for the motion? ministers. Um, like no. who? I've, actually, I've heard that some of junior ministers, they got sacked because they hadn't voted for no, I think, no, um, my recollection is that all, all the ministers, no ministers voted against it. I think some ministers missed the vote, but they didn't get yes. sacked. And they didn't get sacked. They, no, they weren't. They, they, they may have been uh, rebuked for not yes. uh, um, supporting uh, the government, although they're actually in the. But I don't think anybody got sacked as a result of the um, Iraq vote, uh, Syria vote. But um, let me just check up on that and yes. come back to you. Thank you. And on the EU referendum, uh, one of your colleagues, Bill Cash, a few weeks ago, he said that 200 Conservative MPs would like to uh, vote uh, and then to, put, uh, to come out of the EU. So are there 200 Conservative well, MPs who want the, 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 the to The policy come out of the is EU? to renegotiate and then have a vote. Uh, there are a number who have said that if there was a vote now, they would vote to leave. I don't think it's 200. Um, Your colleague? I don't think it's two, no, well, I, I don't think that there's 200 who would vote to leave now. I think the vast majority of those uh, believe that instead of voting to leave now, we should do what the Prime Minister wants to do, which is to renegotiate and then have a referendum. Uh, and if, as I believe he will do, he will negotiate satisfactory terms, I hope we will stay in. But, but the policy is not to have a vote now. The Prime Minister has said that he doesn't find the current settlement acceptable, which is why he wants to change it. And rather than coming out now, I think the sensible thing to do is to give him the chance to change it and then decide. And, um, and do you think that if your, if your party gets re-elected in 2015, will it be practical that uh, the Prime Minister get, uh, get a new uh, treaty ratified by uh, 28 members by uh, uh, 2016? Yes, uh, he believes it's quite practical to negotiate between now and 2017 and then have a referendum in this country to see whether we uh, endorse it. Uh, some countries require referendums, some don't, uh, depending on exactly what has changed. No, I think it's a reasonable deadline. Um, and I think he said uh, a few days ago that if possible he'd like to do it earlier. Now, that may not be possible. But I think the deadline that he's set himself is a realistic one. 
to get the uh, treaty changes negotiated and then endorsed by a referendum. And on immigration, do you think that the government has failed its target to reduce immigration to tens of thousands? Mm. Well, it's a target which I think we're not going to hit, but the Home Secretary has been perfectly explicit about why, in that so far as immigration from outside the EU is concerned, we've taken firm steps on students, on bogus marriages, on language tests, uh, and that has come down quite fast. What hasn't come down has been the Im immigration from within the EU, uh, partly because other countries have had a much worse recession uh, than we've had in this country, and hence has been inward, um, uh, inward migration. But we have a number of proposals to address that concerning principally welfare, entitlement to welfare, uh, and also the ability to send home child benefit if your children aren't with you. So we have a number of measures which we'll put in our manifesto, which we think will deal with some of the, uh, some of the abuses that there have been of the welfare system by those coming here simply to claim welfare benefits. And as you just said, that the government missed its target. Do you think it's one of the reasons that you lost votes to UK in the European election and that you will lose um, uh, votes to UK in the general well, election? I don't think it's quite as simple as that. I think UKIP take votes from the Labour Party as well as from us. And I think UKIP... Like more from your party um, than the Labour yes, Party. Yes, yes. But, but if you look at some of the results in the by-elections in safe Labour seats, uh, like the recent um, uh, by-election in the North West, uh, that UKIP came within a whisker of winning a safe Labour seat. Uh, I think there are other reasons why UKIP have done well. In the old days, the Liberal Democrats, the Liberals were the party of protest, they're now a party of government. And so people who are unhappy with what's happening have turned to UKIP as a protest party. And it's a bit of immigration, it's a bit of EU, and it's a bit of a curse on all your houses. They are not an, 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 a, a party of government, and that's why they've attracted some support. My view is it'll get squeezed between now and the election, when people will have a clear choice between Ed Miliband or David Cameron as Prime Minister. Farage is not going to be a Prime Minister. And if you vote for UKIP, you may miss out on influencing the key decision as to which of those two party leaders will take us through the next five years. And do you think that the Prime Minister is running scared that he doesn't want to no. pass in your No, no, that's absurd. Right. Um, <laughs> the, the, what, what's happened is that there have been proposals for three separate debates, head-to-head -head with Miliband, yeah. three-way, and then uh, a third debate. And the issue is that third debate, where the broadcasters propose to include UKIP but exclude the Greens, and the Prime Minister has said that he'd prefer the Greens to be there, um, as well as UKIP. Um, so he's, he's not, he's not uh, afraid at all. He, uh, he, in fact, he took the initiative last time to establish these uh, three-way debates, and I'm confident that he'll do very well uh, when they take place. And, um, and then if, but um, in, in your opinion, is it not up to an independent body subject to law to decide whether which party should be included and not the party's leaders to decide? Well, I think at the end of the day, um, you can invite the parties to take part. But if they choose not to, um, I don't think you can compel them so to do. And I hope that negotiations will continue and we can find a way for these debates to take place. I think the Prime Minister is also anxious, if possible, to spread them out a bit more rather than have them all crammed into the election campaign to have some uh, before the campaign um, uh, begins. And I hope the negotiations continue and are fruitful. And do you think that the United Kingdom will be united as a whole after the uh, Scottish referendum? Well, I, <laughs> I hope so. We it, did have a referendum. And uh, 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 Alex Salmon at the time implied that this was uh, a once in a, in a sort of generation decision. Um, so I hope we don't have to go around that uh, course again. There was a what a 10 point majority to stay within the, within the UK. And I hope that if we, um, if we carry out our commitment, which I'm sure we will, to give more powers to the Scottish Parliament, um, people will feel well, that's a fair settlement and they'd like to stay within the UK but have the extra powers that we propose to do after them. Do you think that we should have a debate like we had with, for Scottish referendum and the, the turnout was, was high uh, for the general mm. election to engage, more, uh, to engage yeah. public? I think, I think the, 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 the Scottish referendum was very good at um, generating public interest and it was, a, it was a sort of binary decision, you either stay within the UK or you go independent and I think a lot of, uh, nearly all the Scottish people had a view 
uh, particularly at the end of the campaign. Uh, it'd be nice if we could get the same amount of interest um, in, uh, in a, a general election. Uh, I suppose people might argue that it's not quite such a clear-cut decision as breaking up or breaking out of the UK. Uh, but I think it is up to the politicians to explain to people why they ought to vote, why it's important to vote. And I hope we can get it up from where it was at the last election, which in turn was higher than the one before. And while you get, reti uh, you get, you get retired from politics at the next general election after 40 years in politics, Sir George, will you, get, will you still get involved in politics after you left Parliament? Well, I'll still support my party. Um, in fact, during the election campaign, I'll go out and help colleagues in marginal seats. And if you've been in politics for 40 years, you will continue to take an interest in politics. There obviously won't be quite such a direct one as if you're a member of parliament. And if we propose you to um, to go um, at the, to go to the House of Lords, will you accept it? Well, that, that is, uh, the Prime Minister decides who goes to the House of Lords, and I'm not making any assumptions or saying anything about that at all. And my last question, after 40 years, what has changed in parliament when now that you're leaving? Well, um, a lot has changed. The hours have changed. We stop at a reasonable hour in the evenings instead of going on through the night. Uh, Parliament is now broadcast, which it wasn't when I started. There are now more, many more women MPs and MPs from ethnic minorities, both of which are good and we need more. Uh, we have better working conditions. We're here in this room. When I started, I shared a room with 600 people. Um, and the support we get for staff has improved enormously. We can now employ about three members of staff. When I started, it was one. So. Those, I think, are three or four of the major changes since I started. Oh. Well, thank okay. you very much for your time. Sir. Okay, thank you, Amir. Thank you very much.